thanks for thanks for coming. We'll see how this goes and if we if we do this again. So this is the experimental scripture boggle webinar. And we'll like I said, we'll we'll see how this goes. I am uh, actually pretty excited to see how this goes. I've I've wanted to do this for a little while and just kind of get a, a feel for how other people study the scriptures and um, kind of what goes through people's heads as we, um, you know, encounter a phrase or a verse. And so um, we'll just, I'll share uh, just to real briefly a couple of things to get us started, and then we'll jump into kind of the ground rules for how I think would be a good way to proceed. And this will be extremely informal and flexible. So um, first thing here, I've got this uh, quote from Howard W. Hunter. He said, uh, this is in General Conference 1979. He said, we should not be haphazard in our reading, but rather develop a systematic plan for study. There are some who read to a schedule of a number of pages or a set number of chapters each day or week. This may be perfectly justifiable and may be enjoyable if one is reading for pleasure, but it does not constitute meaningful study. It is better to have a set amount of time to give scriptural study each day than to have a set amount of chapters to read. Sometimes we find that the study of a single verse will occupy the whole time. And I don't know about you guys, but this week... I've uh, tried to dive deep into this verse that we're going to discuss, and I've, I've spent a lot of hours trying to just kind of dive deep and understand uh, different aspects of each of the phrases. And I, I thought, you know, trying to come up with sort of a, a way to study this, I just broke it up into phrases. And I thought we'd just proceed this way, and we'll, we'll just take it one phrase at a time. I don't know how you guys studied it yet. We haven't talked about that um, building up to this, but this is how I broke it up. And so we'll just take each phrase and just kind of uh, go in that way. And I, I chose this verse, uh, purely by revelation, I guess. I literally, I, I, uh, was like trying to think of a verse, like, what should I pick that would be a good, meaningful verse that would have lots of things that, uh, we can study. And I, as I was thinking about it, I thought, well, why don't I just pray and ask if, if there's a particular verse I should be led to? And I, I no sooner started to pray about it, and Mosiah 3.8 popped in my head, and I'm like, okay, wait, I, that was too quick. I don't, I don't even know what that says off the top of my head, so I'm sure that was probably just a completely brain-sponsored uh, idea that popped into my head. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, I should look that up. And I, I looked it up and, and I saw this. And at first I was like, um, is that going to be a really good verse? Maybe I shouldn't. And it finally hit me like, okay, I'm just, I'm just being dumb and second guessing the spirit. And, uh, you know, after 15 or 30 seconds, I was like, yeah, okay. I, I'm sure I was prompted to pick this. And there is definitely plenty of stuff to study here. And uh, it's also convenient because it's, it's easy to break this up into phrases. And so anyway, that, that's kind of the quick backstory of why this verse, but uh, the kind of way, the format that I thought we would take with this is I'll just start off and share a little of the background of the verse. And then if you guys have any uh, additional thoughts on the background of the verse, chime in with it, and then we'll just take it a phrase at a time. And I, I don't need to start off each of these discussions uh, on the phrases. I've got my stuff kind of put into a PowerPoint slide deck. If you guys want to share your screen at some point, you can do that. If you just have thoughts you want to share, that's totally fine. And we'll just kind of go through the list. And if one of us shares a, a thought, um, it, we can just all cross it off our list. That's the boggle element of the uh, experiment. And we'll just go through sharing things and I'm not as, I'm not, uh, I mean, I want the insights, but I'm kind of more interested in like, why did you choose to study a certain thing that led you to that insight? I, I want to get to kind of like um, the thought process behind how you got to that end result. And so, um, you know, 
I'll start us off, but then like with each of these, we'll just rotate through and somebody else can start um, each one of these. And um, then we'll all share until we've exhausted that phrase and go on to the next one. So uh, let's get started here. And Chris, if you're back, feel free to unmute. The background for this verse, uh, it's 124 BC and King Benjamin is speaking to his people. And the people are a mixture of Nephites that escaped with his father, Mosiah the first, and Mulekites that were in the land that they went to, Zarahemla. And we actually, what we know of the Mulekites when Mosiah arrived there was they didn't have any scriptural records with them, and they actually denied the being of their creator, which is um, kind of interesting because, you know, part of this verse is uh, King Benjamin bringing up the, the fact that Jesus Christ was the creator of all things. But uh, we know that they, they denied, at least, you know, when the Nephites arrived, the being of their creator. And this is a large gathering. King Benjamin's called at the end of his life to um, announce his son's going to be king and um, bring his people together under covenant to more fully take upon them the name of the Lord. And chapter three is a sharing of the words of an angel. Largely, he, he announces that at the beginning. And then the last few verses are the direct words of the Lord. So this verse that we're talking about came from the words of the angel. And I don't know if any of you have anything you'd like to add to that, um, or if you looked at the background, is there is there anything that you guys would like to add? Yeah, I, I, I spent a little bit of time trying to understand the context. Um, I've uh, One of the things that, that I've uh, recently reread is a, a book by um, James Faulkner called um, Scripture Study Tools and Suggestions. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've seen, you may have seen that. I think you actually referenced it in, in, in your study guides because you, you've got some similar concepts in there. But anyway, one of the things that, that he strongly recommends when you're doing a deep study or a close study or a close reading, as he calls it, um, on a particular verse or set of verses is to understand the context. And so I typically like to look a little bit back, a little bit forward. Um, and so I did just that and, and came up with pretty much the same summary outline that you did. Um but I do think it's important to understand, you know, who is speaking, who's he speaking to, and, and, and kind of what's the purpose. And I find it uh, interesting that, you know, if we think about it at this point, um, you know, this, it's before the Savior's come. And so um, it, it, we, we'll get there in a bit. But I, I find it interesting that, as, as we all know, Jesus Christ is actually, um, you know, the Greek form of that name. And so there's some interesting things to think about there, but we can save that for a little bit later. But I do like the idea of understanding the context and the history, uh, who's speaking, who's being spoken to, so that you can uh, better appreciate the context for which this, this particular uh, scripture is, 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 is related to. Great. Thanks for uh, sharing that. And I haven't read that particular uh, book um, by James Falconer. Um, I just have uh, one of his books and I, I've uh, seen, he's got uh, a couple of things for free on one of the BYU uh, library sites. So um, anyway, let's go ahead and move on to the first phrase. If nobody has anything else they want to add to on the background. Well, and I, I think in one of the studies that I had done, one of the interesting things I had noticed in at least those short books right before is that we're coming, you know, coming into Mosiah here, we're, we're, we're almost coming off of a, a 200 year apostasy. Um, Cause there, you know, just, it just seemed like there was at least for my study in, in Jerem and Omni, the way that the way that the writers made it sounded that there were, you know, 200 years without, without really any words from any prophets among the people. I mean, it was, it was a pretty big dry spell for them. So then, and now you have, and now you have King Mosiah coming in here, King Benjamin coming in here uh, with this. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so this first phrase, we'll get started here. Um, and he shall be called Jesus Christ. And Brad, you mentioned about the, the name that's, that's kind of where I started with, with this, you know, this is before the birth of Christ. Um, and so I just, I was interested mostly in uh, three words called Jesus and Christ. 
uh, in this phrase. And, and then I, I wanted to know where did the title Christ first originate and when was it first used in scripture? Those are a couple of questions that I wrote down about this particular uh, phrase. And so um, the word called, uh, as I got studying that, I, I was like, well, is that, you know, somebody calls you, they can, that can be naming somebody or it could be a, a calling and certainly both of those apply for Christ. And so I started looking for Greek meanings of uh, called and name to see if there was much of a difference. And both of them have different words that infer a certain nuance, but um, both of them also use the word lego, which means to break silence. So literally to call by name uh, is, is the meaning of that. Um, but Christ was also foreordained and called to his mission. And there's, you know, in the topical guide, there's a, a topic there, Jesus Christ foreordained, which um, I'd recently read through. And so that was, that was the first part on called. I'll just, I'll stop there. Does anybody have anything to add on? I don't know what, I mean, I, I've got uh, other stuff on Jesus Christ here to share, but does anybody have any thoughts even just on the word called or anything you've thought about that? The only other comment that I'll make is the footnote in that verse 8a in the LDS scriptures uh, takes you to the same topical guide, right? Only okay. it's, it's for ordination, comma, Jesus Christ, but, or maybe that's two different things. Oh, no, it is two different things. It's to, a topical guide for ordination. And then a second one, Jesus Christ, comma, prophecies about. Okay. So it's, yeah. So I always love to, when I'm doing a deeper reading, to always look at the footnotes and I end up going on tangents, reading a scripture chain that takes you from one verse to the next and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's, uh, there's a lot of tangents to go on when you start diving deep on a verse. And uh, so that's kind of where I went all week was just like, where next? So. Okay, so the word Jesus um, in the Greek is Iesus, and it has it says here, uh, you know, from Strong's, it's of Hebrew origin, and so I just started to trace it back through um, to Yehoshua, and I'm I'm not any kind of uh, Greek or Hebrew uh, scholar to pronounce these things. I'm just kind of going off the pronunciation here, which. Anyway, this, this word is Joshua, and it means Jehovah is salvation or Jehovah saves. So um, Yeshua, Yehoshua um, is where Jesus comes from, and it, it means Jehovah saves or delivers uh, the self-existent or eternal to exist. And so these are, uh, I'm not going to take the time to like go into each of these little images, um, but that's, that's kind of where it comes from. And then Christ comes from Christos, which means anointed. And that has a root that literally goes back to anoint with oil or consecrate to an office. And um, I did look at uh, this, like you're, you're all familiar with some of these verses, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. And so that anointing, creo, is, is literal you know, Christ was, means anointed. Um, and so the search to search the Christ, that was another search that I did. Um, and that led me to find uh, Messiah, And that means anointed one, which comes from Messiah, consecrated Messiah, which again means anoint with oil. And so there's these verses that talk about the Messiah and it, it just literally means the anointed one. And so Jesus Christ is the self-existent, which reminds me of I am, and eternal Jehovah saves. And then Christ is the anointed and consecrated Messiah. And so um, that, was, that was on the name side of things. And then I, I wanted to know what's the first instance of the use of Messiah in the scriptures? And so I started to try and trace this, and there, there's not a lot of instances where the, the word Messiah actually appears. There's only a, a few, but that, tracing that back, um, you know, I found the word, which is anointed, and the actual first use of that word as 
a reference to Christ is actually in First Samuel. And there's lots of symbols, of course, of, of Christ and his mission prior to this. But the first one that I could find was First Samuel 235 here in the uh, this slide uh, where he, he says, he shall walk before mine anointed forever. So God's going to raise up a faithful priest that will walk before mine anointed or the Messiah forever. And so that was the first instance I could find um, where it's used in the Bible. And then uh, aside from that, in the Pearl Great Price, we can actually go back further um, to Moses's time where um, he identifies, he, he has the revelation that uh, identifies Jesus Christ is the only name given whereby salvation will come. And so we actually have Christ's name in the Old Testament setting and people, you know, the prophets knew who he was. So that was my research on the, the first phrase. So when, you know, let's uh, see what else anybody discovered and and then we'll move on to the next one. Okay, I find uh, the word uh, anointing to be very interesting. In Leviticus uh, chapter 8, uh, verse 12, it says, And he, that's Moses, poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. So when we talk about Christ as the anointed one, we're talking about him as being the sanctified one. And sanctified means purified or uh, I can't think of another word in that context, but, uh, but that relates to, to a lot of other things that we do in the church, I think such as priesthood blessings. We anoint. Why do we anoint? Why do we have washings and anointings in the temple prior to the endowment? Anointing is to sanctify. Yeah, that's a great point. So what, what led you to this particular verse in Leviticus? Was it just, you, you just knew that verse, you were aware of it, and it just reminded you of it? Or did you study a particular thing that led you there? Well, <laughs> I just gave a priesthood lesson today, as a matter of fact, and uh, my wife and I, are, we do a daily scripture reading, and we were reading Leviticus, and we read that verse, and I said, wow, that, uh, that relates to section 110 of the Doctrine and Covenants, that, that relates to priesthood blessings and what we were talking about, so that's where my study picked it up. Okay, great. Brad, Chris, any any thoughts on that uh, phrase that we're looking at? I, I don't have anything to add. I don't okay. either. Okay. Well, let's go back here and uh, we'll go on to the next section. So the son of God is the next phrase. And did, does anybody else want to start before I go through anything I uh, studied? If not, I'm, I'm happy to just move forward. So um, what I, first came to mind for me was, okay, he's the son of God. So what is, what is the son of God, the king of heaven, imply? And I, I thought about, well, if you're the son of the king, you have certain rights and privileges. And so um, I did a search on those words in the scriptures, and I'll show what I found there. And then as a son, uh, you know, from Christ's life, we know he was always subservient to his father's will, always gave glory to his father, never seeking it for himself. And his entire life was one of showing us how to be a child of God that possesses all things, yet used his resources, physical and spiritual, to care for his fellow brothers and sisters. And so the, those were some of the things that were kind of in my mind as I was looking for, you know, well, where does the word rights or privileges appear in the scriptures and how does it apply to Christ? You know, are there even specific instances outlining what rights and privileges he had as the son of God that gives us some kind of insight into that? And so when I searched for the word rights, 
I was surprised to not even find that word in the old, uh, in the Bible. And I, I got, uh, there's 23 results. And as I went through those 20 of them were about maintaining rights of freedom within the law. That's, you know, the book of Mormon is really heavy on uh, the rights of the people uh, maintaining their freedom. Uh, one verse talked about the rights of the priesthood. One verse talked about the rights of holding priesthood keys. And then there was one verse that talked about Christ's rights. And this was the verse, uh, Moroni 727. Uh, Moroni says, wherefore, my beloved brethren, have miracles ceased because Christ ascended into heaven and sat down on the right hand of God to claim of the father his rights of mercy, which he hath upon the children of men. I thought that was really interesting. The, the only set of rights mentioned in the scriptures for Christ, although we know he has a right to the throne and, and other things as the son of God, but he has the rights of mercy because of the atonement um, that, that flow to him because of what he did. And then I did a search for who's right, trying to see like, cause there were other, if I did a search for just the word, right, there were hundreds of results because, you know, right hand, uh, you know, turn to the right, all those kind of things were there. So I was like, well, how do I narrow that down? And so I did a search for who's right. And, and found a couple more verses because it's Christ's right to reign. Um, so in Ezekiel, it, uh, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. And it shall be no more until he come whose right it is to rule. And the same thing in the Doctrine and Covenants, until he reigns whose right it is to reign. And then I did um, the search for privileges. Same thing. Privilege doesn't appear in the Bible but it does appear in the Book of Mormon Doctrine and Covenants. And again, privilege is, is often used in conjunction with rights. Um, your rights and privileges is mentioned quite a bit in the Book of Mormon. But there were these two instances of privileges that they don't re relate directly to uh, Christ, but sort of this first one in Alma talking about the pre-mortal life and the faithfulness of the individual's um, uh, Alma says, um, let's see, if, let's see, thus they having been called to this holy calling on account of their faith, while others would reject the spirit of God on account of the hardness of their hearts and blindness of their minds. Well, if it had not been for this, they might've had as great privilege as their brethren. So faithfulness determines our, our spiritual privileges. And then Section 67, verse 10, has the greatest privilege uh, mentioned in Scripture. Uh, it's a promise that God gives us that if we strip ourselves of our jealousies and fears and humble ourselves before him, uh, the veil will be rent and we'll see him and know that he is, not with the carnal or natural mind, but with the spiritual. And so I was really fascinated by um, this search for uh, privileges uh, there's there's actually quite a bit in the scriptures. That's kind of a fun set of scriptures to read through. There's not too many of them, um, you know, just uh, 38 or something like that, 39, 37, 37. Anyway, kind of fun. Um, so does anybody else have anything on uh, the Son of God phrase that you studied or thought about or want to share? Yeah, one of the... Um things that I had studied not too long ago was, uh, was on, it was on the Jewish marriage or Jewish marriage tradition and, uh, just kind of the events, you know, leading up to leading up to the final marriage. And I, you know, cause throughout the new Testament and the scriptures, there's, there is this, there's this, uh, huge, uh, theme of, of marriage, you know, we, or Zion being the bride and, and, the, and the son being the, the groom, and uh, it's 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 quite interesting to when you talk about the rights and the privileges there. It's it's interesting to see in, in the marriage tradition of in the, Jew, the Jewish tradition how you know the bride and the groom stay separate for a long period of time, and the groom the bride is to stay prepared uh, as 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 prepared as she can uh, for a long period of time, and and to be prepared daily for when the call goes out. That the bridegroom is coming 
but it's interesting on the on the on the groom side or the sun side is that is that during that particular side of it, um, you know, the, uh, as I understand, if I recall everything correctly, is that the is that the father essentially essentially backs up into a more advisory role and lets and basically lets his son run run the family run the family business of the property under his direction and but so the son can go out and in the name of the father you know do things so so it's the son's responsibility to you know to build uh you know a marriage home uh for his for him and his future wife and to and to handle family you know family affairs family business in the name of his father and so in a lot of ways but all, but all of this happening under under the direction of the of the father or the oversight of the father so it essentially gives the son a chance to do the work of the father under the direction of the father so i feel like there's this very interesting role here that the savior himself is potentially learning in his in his standing here as, as he's learning in a much greater sense the work of being you know like his father as well um and so but but because he's anointed to do this now now it's put upon him this this great responsibility to now build a build a home or build a something for the future marriage when, when he, he and his wife or you know when Zion and us are, are eventually united when the call goes out so I just thought that was really quite interesting it is I've never heard that particular aspect of it before about uh, a son sort of taking over the business to um, learn the ropes and um, be able to uh, build a home for himself and his future bride. That's, that's really interesting. Any other thoughts anybody would like to share? Comment on that? Well, so in, in my study, um, specifically around this title of son or son of God, it just took me to dozens and dozens of scriptures. And so it just expanded my understanding of the Savior's role as the Son of God, as I as I read through those various verses, I don't have any any particular verses in mind, but just as I went through that process, it was very helpful. So that is one of the things that that I really enjoy about doing a deeper dive on scriptures is you can really kind of um, increase not only your depth but your breadth of a particular topic by you know hyper focusing on that. So did you just do like a search for the word son and just look at those references or what, what did you kind of dive into there? Yeah, it was more or less following links. Um, you know, I used the LDS citation index to see what uh, various, uh, you know, prophets and apostles have said about the topic, but mainly, you know, just looking at various scriptures, uh, referencing the topical guide. Um, I didn't actually go in and do a search on any particular topic. I should have done that, but it just didn't, just didn't get around to doing that. Was there a particular topic in the topical guide that you looked up or not really? Uh, I'd have to go back and look. I didn't write it down, but um, sorry, I don't have it in front of me. Okay. Yeah, no problem. I just was curious if there was something that um, you'd, particularly found there. Bob, anything else you'd like to share? Uh, well, not particularly right on topic with, with you. So I, I was going to share something about the veil, but uh, that's not quite on topic. So I guess I won't. Okay. Yeah, I guess right here, there's uh, son of God, son of man, topical guide topics, and, and then one on just sun as well, um, which is uh, a little bit more generic about suns, it looks like. So, okay. Yeah, cool. and there's also, there's also a Bible dictionary reference to son of God as well. Okay, yeah. We'll be, we're actually actively working on getting the Bible dictionary into the app right now. So that will be 
And once that's done, then we can add the uh, LDS footnotes into the app because they, you know, often reference topical guide, Bible dictionary, stuff like that. So we'll be adding that into scripture notes as soon as we can. Okay, let's go to the next phrase. Well, I actually had one more thing to share. I don't know if it if it fits here or not, but I'll just take a minute here. So um, if you're familiar with the Scripture Plus app, um, it's put on by the, uh, I, I forget the name of the group that does it. It's the Neil A. Maxwell Institute or something along those lines. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, uh, I, I always enjoy when I'm looking at something to, to see what, you know, the various, they've got several different things like videos, they've got images, they've got insights, and then, and then they've got a, a, a thing called historical setting. Um, under the insights one, there was a, so this is kind of taking a step back instead of looking at each one of these phrases, looking at the, the fact that there was at least four different titles provided. And, and, and so there's something called uh, No Why, number 536, and it was, it was titled, Why Did Benjamin Give Multiple Names for Jesus? And in here, there was a, an interesting insight that I did not realize and had, had never really thought about before, but I'll just kind of read a, a, a little blurb here. So it says, at the center of the passage, one thing that stands out are the four names or titles which the angel gave the coming of Messiah, and he lists them out, and then goes on to talk about um, that apparently in in, um, uh, in in both Egypt as well as in the Old Testament times, it says that uh, a, a king taking on a, a a new name or set of titles at his coronation was a signal of legitimacy to the rise of power. To, pro to proclaim his divine appointment, taking on a new name or titles, thus accredited the king with various qualities and accomplishments that marked his rule. And it goes on to talk about how this was a, a formal time-honored practice, um, you know, in Egypt uh, with the, the five names of the Pharaoh and part of the ascension ceremony and Egyptian beliefs and so on and so forth. So anyway, I thought it was just interesting that Christ who comes to reign as, as a king here on earth um, you know, and, and you've got Messiah who's getting ready to pass on and, and he's getting ready to, to, to bring up Messiah in his stead as the next king. I, I just love the parallel there of, of this concept of the names and the titles that, uh, that relate not only to Christ, but also as, as being a king. And then, and then interestingly enough, as I went down that path further, it led me, obviously, to what are the names of Christ? And so, uh, you know, one of the infamous scriptures, uh, Isaiah 9, 6, talks about, you know, wonderful, uh, mighty, you know, Prince of Peace. And, 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 and so it, it took me down to, um, you know, the different names of Christ or the different titles. And, and you can just spend a lot of time going through that. I, I've uh, recently purchased Elder Holland's book on the names of, or the, I forget the exact name, but it's the names and uh, of Jesus Christ or something like that. And I'm uh, looking forward to studying that more as well. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, did, uh, in that particular article, was it just focused on King Benjamin's sermon, the, the titles that he gave Christ? Yes. Okay. It was specific to this verse. So if you go into the scripture plus app, and you go to Messiah 3, 8, it's, it's one of the things. So it's just related to this verse. That's okay, right. Okay, cool. All right. Well, here's the next uh, phrase, the father of heaven and earth. And <clears throat> I just started off, you know, doing searches for heaven and then heavens and then eternal father. And, uh, you know, there's only two people in scripture that refer to Christ as the eternal father. It was Abinadi and Amulek in the book of Mormon. And so I started, you know, that, that kind of triggered my uh, mind thinking back on elder McConkie's reasons um, or a list of reasons that Christ can properly be called the father. And I, I found two things that were interesting. Uh, the first thing, uh, as I was looking for, Elder McConkie's statement was an article I found at this um, BYU EDU 
uh, website. It's an article called The Role of Christ as the Father in the Atonement. And one of the things that this uh, Paul Hoskinson here talks about in this article, it's not a very long article, but it's, it's really interesting. He breaks down Abinadi's speech, and you can see it here. This is kind of the, like a summary um, table that he put into his article. Christ has dual titles, father and son. He has parentage where he's begotten by God, but he's conceived by Mary. He has a dual nature that's spirit and flesh and a dual capacity that because he was the son of God begotten by the father, he didn't have to die. But because he was conceived by Mary and he was of the flesh in that respect, he could die if he chose to. And so the whole article is, is basically getting to the idea that Christ didn't have to die. He didn't have to die on the cross. Even when he was on the cross, he didn't have to die. He, he literally chose to die to complete his work on the earth. And I thought that was, that was interesting. And then, of course, um, Elder McConkie lists out uh, three reasons that Christ is the father or can be called the father because he's the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's the father of those who are born again, and he's the father because of divine investiture of authority, where the father puts you know, his name upon the son, essentially. And so um, that, was, that was stuff I studied about that particular phrase, the uh, father of heaven and earth. So what else did uh, anybody um, kind of research on that? So this topic earlier in my, uh, you know, when I was actually serving a mission many, many years ago, I just, I, you know, I kind of struggled with the literal meaning of the Savior referred to as both the Father and the Son. One of the things that really helped me as I, you know, studied that topic was um, James E. Talmadge's uh, Articles of Faith. He's got a section in there in Lecture 2 uh, that talks about uh, Christ as both the Father and the Son, and that was certainly helpful. And then he actually references, um, I'm trying to read it here, he references a something that was put out by, I think it was uh, the First Presidency and the Twelve Apostles in 1916. It's called The Father and the Son, a, Dro a Doctrinal Exposition by the First Presidency and the Twelve. And I guess that appeared in the in the improvement era in, in 1916, and later it was published as a pamphlet. But uh, I, I didn't actually take the time to read it recently. But I just remember that this topic for me was was a bit confusing as I was, uh, you know, really trying to understand these scriptures and the meaning. And and I, you know, I I too got hung up a little bit with how Abinadi made that reference. And over the years, I've as I've referenced these different topics and thought more about it. Um, it's certainly in, in helped with my understanding. And, 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 you know, now that I'm a father of four children that are all grown and, and moved on, what really helps me the most is, is that I'm a son and I'm a father. Not in the same sense that Jesus Christ is, but that helps me to understand how he can be both a father and a son, um, you know, literally from that perspective, um, but uh, I, I've just found that, that referencing some of the other additional um, insights that just, just different authority, general authorities and prophets have to say really help to enhance, uh, you know, things that may appear to be confusing in the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Bob, Chris, uh, any thoughts? All right. Well, let's move on to the next one. Um, the creator of all things. Uh, I just pulled up, you know, the topical guide and just pasted in here a few things that uh, are related to Christ being creator or the creation. Um, those are all things that can be studied uh, in relation to this particular phrase. Um, somebody else want to start on this particular phrase? Anything that you learned as you were studying? Well, one of the things that interested me in my studying was uh, section 88, verse 7, which talks about the, the light of Christ. And then it goes on, which is the interesting part to me. 
as also he is in the sun and the light of the sun and the power thereof by which it was made. So it's the power of Christ that's created heavens and earth as I read that. If you go down to verse 11, the first part of it, there and the light which shineth, which giveth you light, is through him who enlighteneth your eyes. It's a pretty magnificent concept. Yeah. It's going to be, uh, I guess I can say, eye-opening when we <laughs> get to get to the other side and and realize the the vastness and the how the the spirit of God permeates everything and and what all it it does. Um, Absolutely everything. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks. Um, Aspen posted in the uh, chat here. Um, she did a search for father of heaven in quotes and got 50 results. And then as she read through those, she looked in the topical guide to Jesus Christ relationship with the father uh, to learn about the father, the savior's relationship with the father. So she could learn what mine can be like, or hers. I'm, I'm reading this in third person, what hers could be like, or should be like. So that's another uh, good suggestion there. Thanks Aspen. Okay, anything else about uh, on the creator that somebody uh, looked up? I'll, I'll share uh, what I saw here um, as I started to do some of these, um, some of this research. There's a couple of verses that I thought were really interesting in Isaiah where it talks about he stretcheth forth the heavens alone and he spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. And I was trying to picture, you know, what that was like. And are any of you familiar with the book Flatland? Ever heard of that? So this was a book written, I, I think, in the 1800s by a minister. And basically, and you can go on to YouTube and you'll even see like Carl Sagan uh, kind of talking about the concept in this book. That essentially like picture a flat surface a plane that has two-dimensional objects on it and then one day a three-dimensional object comes along that hovers over this this plane and uh carl sagan uses an apple uh over this area but how does the two-dimensional object on the plane like if it's a square how does it view this object in a third dimension it can't describe it because it's like it's beyond its capacity or, you know, as Paul might say, it's unlawful for me to utter these things. Cause I can't even, I can't even put it into words. What uh, I experienced, what, what I looked up and saw because God's a, a higher dimensional being. And so this flatland book, just, it, it steps you into this notion that like, we can't comprehend something in another dimension, but that higher dimension being can look down at a lower dimension and it's essentially all in front of him. It's all spread out. And so as I read these phrases, I kind of, that kind of came to mind this idea that for like God being whatever dimensional uh, kind of being he is, maybe he literally can look at the earth and say, it's all spread out in front of me. I see everything at every point in time and uh, including the heavens, it's all in front of him. And, and so he looks down from this higher dimension and sees it as if it's flat because it, later we know that the, uh, the earth will be rolled up as a scroll, which also implies it's like this flat two-dimensional kind of object to God in a sense, even though to us, we perceive it, you know, as all around us and round and, and such. So anyway, that was a couple of things that um, I looked at and thought about there. And then when it says all things, I started thinking about, well, you know, what are all things? And there's, if you do a search for that with quotes in uh, scripture notes, you'll find 518 results, which is way too big to study. Um, but there are some verses that talk about uh, all things. And I, I started thinking, well, 
you know, what's all things to, to Christ that he created? The universe, the galaxy, a multiverse, you know, other dimensions. Uh, how much of this universe is temporary in a dimension? Um, and then spiritual versus temporal. Our spirits were created by our Heavenly Father, but what other spiritual creations were done by Christ? Like all the animal life um, and such. And I, you know, there's a couple of verses here. Um, Isaiah 42, 5, Christ, you know, ends there and spirit to them that walk there. And so he, he created the heavens, the earth. Um, he, he that giveth breath unto the people of it, which goes back to what Bob mentioned a minute ago, the light, you know, the life that comes from Jesus Christ is our breath as well, gives us breath and spirit to them that walk therein so that it powers our spirits. Uh, and then Moses 3, 7 informs us that um, man became a living soul, the first flesh upon the earth. And so everything was created spiritually, but Adam was actually uh, apparently here before the animals. And, uh, you know, so we don't know exactly how that works, but Moses tells us he was the first flesh upon the earth. And, you know, a few of the verses that say all things, God says, all things are present with me. All things are numbered unto me. Uh, he created all things spiritually before they were on the face of the earth and all things which I prepared for the use of man. And there's another one here. Uh, Alma, this is a well-known verse on the symbolism of everything. The scriptures are laid before thee and all things denote there is a God. Yea, even the earth and all things that are upon the face of it, yea, in its motion and also all the planets, which move in their regular form, do witness there is a supreme creator. And so that's a, a verse that deals with creation and just the vastness of uh, that. And there's, there's tons of stuff we could talk about on symbolism, but there's two things that I um, had brought to mind as I was thinking about this. One of them, and, and maybe some of you have seen this before, but there's this video, it's only two minutes, two and a half minutes on YouTube. It's called Star Size Comparison One. This is the coolest video. Uh, you can't even see our sun. It's, it's on the left of that picture as like just a, a pinhead. And, and it, there's, it, it takes the vastness of things that they know exist out in the universe and just shows the progression from one size to the next. And this isn't even the biggest object. You'll have to watch that video. It's really cool. And then uh, the recently I came across this video on YouTube. It just popped up and said, uh, this guy, Stephen Axford has made kind of a career out of filming in slow motion fungus growing. And I, I gotta say, I had no desire to look at fungus, but this, this blue mushroom caught my attention. I thought, well, I'll watch a couple minutes of this and see, you know, what this is. Cause that's a really beautiful, um, mushroom. And I was stunned at the incredible world of fungus. I, and I was just like, imagine the detail that goes into everything that God has created. And this is just one little tiny thing that we all kind of probably think is insignificant. And there's such beauty and detail in the different kinds of fungus that exist in the forest. And it just really brought home to me the diversity of what God has created. And so those are a couple of cool uh, videos if you're interested in checking those out. Um, but that was, that was uh, what I, I put down about um, Christ being creator. And uh, anybody have any thoughts on that or any other thoughts on this particular phrase? Well, so we recently had the opportunity to go to the temple in Atlanta. One of, uh, one of the youth that my wife taught seminary to uh, was uh, going through for her own endowment and the temples open for live ordinances. And so they invited us to participate in that. And as we were going through there, um, you know, we just reminded of the, the creation process and that it was done really through uh, the priesthood power and authority. And, and, you know, we don't, it, it hasn't been revealed exactly how, 
but I'm convinced that a, a lot of it is, you know, probably through spoken word, right? As you, as you read through the scriptures and as you listen to that, you know, it will let there be light and, and there was light. Now, exactly how the mechanics of that worked, uh, we don't know, but, you know, if you think about the creation process and, and you could, you could spend a lot of time really studying that topic as well. And so it, you know, as we, as I've thought about that, it, it just uh, gave new insights into, you know, the power of the priesthood that comes through, you know, through spoken word. When God speaks, you know, it, it happens. And, and so that's just an amazing concept. And so you, you could really spend some time thinking about savior, creator, and dig into you know how did the creation process work as best as we know it and 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 link that into or tie that into the concept of priesthood authority yeah that's that's a good point um and i I think you're exactly right you know paul talks about um the world was the worlds were created by faith and it starts as a thought and comes out as a word and god commands and things obey so I think that's right on. Um, Bob or Aspen, any thoughts on any other thoughts on uh, Christ as creator? Well, everything was created spiritually first. And uh, I believe that's why miracles can happen is it's the spirits that are being directed. Move a mountain, you tell the mountain, well, the part of the mountain that's spirit, which is all of it, obeys. Yeah. Interesting thought, isn't it? It is. It is. It's so deep that to, to try and just uh, get your, your mind wrapped around that. I, I don't, I don't know that any of us can, unless we have kind of the uh, gift of faith to kind of be on that level and say, you know, like Enoch, uh, you know, okay, let's move this mountain and believe that it's going to happen. We've, we've got to be gifted with that kind of faith as well. Okay, let's uh, move on here to from the beginning um you know i just i always just start off when i see words just you know well where where else does it appear in the scriptures and so beginning appears 239 times from the beginning is 95 times some of those indicate an actual point of reference for the start of something and some are things that it mentions without beginning like priesthood um and so i just wondered well what what is this from the beginning? Is it a round of creation or is it from the beginning of eternity? Is it a specific or an infinite time? And, you know, just a couple of the verses here, like third Nephi 11, Christ said, he suffered the will of the father in all things from the beginning, uh, which led me to thinking about he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so foundation and beginning are kind of related. And, uh, the word foundation in Greek comes from this katabole or however you say that, which means literally the conception of something. And, and this word is also the same Greek word is used talking about um, conception for birth and to conceive an idea. And so uh, as I thought about that at the conception of things, that brought me back to Abraham 3, where Christ says, uh, as he's talking to Abraham about the council in heaven, I came down in the beginning in the midst of all these intelligences that thou hast seen. And so this council in heaven was kind of the conception point. So I thought, well, that's the point at which Christ um, probably in the beginning uh, became our savior. And so that was kind of how I, uh, my thought process led me to that point. Uh, and I don't know if you guys have any other thoughts about that or different, different thoughts. No, I didn't actually get to this far. You know, I, 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 I was so focused on the, the, the names of the savior up above that I did not even get down to these last few parts of this verse. If you can believe that. <laughs> I, I do. I know I, I had to, uh, kind of pace myself like, okay, I, I got to make sure I get through everything. Cause it is easy to get kind of lost in uh, tangents and and be studying one section for whatever days and hours so i totally get that bob do you have any thoughts no okay uh so the 
the next one here, the last part is, um, oops, and his mother shall be called Mary. And I don't know if you've ever looked this up, but I, I didn't know this. Um, in Greek, the word for Mary is Maria. And it means rebellious. And I was kind of surprised to see like, wait a minute, Mary means rebellious. Um, how, how does that uh, fit in? And it actually goes back. It's of Hebrew origin. And it goes back to uh, the proper name of the sister of Moses, which is Miriam. And so Miriam means rebelliously. And I was like, well, that's really weird. You know, how, how is it that Mary and Miriam come from this sort of negative connotation? And um, Miriam comes from Mary, which also means rebellious and bitter. And I thought, wow, this is, this is getting more and more negative. And you can see that this, this word down here is translated as rebellious, rebellion, bitter, and rebels. And so I was like, wow, that's the root of that word. And uh, it goes back, this is the primitive root, like the, I guess as far back as the word goes, comes from Mara, which again means rebel, provoke, disobedient, bitter, and provocation. And I started thinking, okay, this is really interesting and unexpected. And I started to think though about, um, and I, I, maybe I've got this on one of my next slides. Let me let me jump forward here. Uh, yeah, I think I think I do have it on the next one. So then then what my research started to take me to, I did a, a search um, because I, I remember hearing this idea that a lot of women were named Mary because there was some Jewish tradition that the Messiah would come through somebody named Mary. And I, I, I couldn't remember where I'd heard that if it was real or not. And I don't know. I, I, I don't know if either of you know that, but what I found was this um, academic paper that showed that from this period of time around when, uh, you know, th well, 330 BC to 200 AD, half the women were either named Salome or Mary or Maria. It was, ex they were extremely popular names. And I, I, you know, there were a couple articles here, but, you know, one interesting article there on Miriam. And I started thinking, like, why was it such a popular name? Like, Miriam was called a prophetess. And I thought, well, maybe because she was a prophetess, the people were um, trying to, you know, name their kids after her. But then I had this other thought about Mary, and I was just shocked that it, it meant rebellious. And then I, um, you know, as I looked it up, there are six different Marys in the New Testament, and then there's Miriam in the Old Testament. And I thought, why would anyone name their child that if it means a rebel? Because it's negative. And then I thought, well, what's the positive view? And I thought, well, if Miriam was a rebel in Egypt under slavery, during bitter slavery, and became a prophetess, maybe that's what made the name popular. And it was actually like, a positive connotation is one rebelling against oppression and being close to God. And so that, that was kind of a wild uh, little goose chase there coming to that point, uh, which I'd never thought about. I, have you, either of you ever thought about that? Or do you have any other thoughts on his mother shall be called Mary? No, but that's an amazing, uh, that's an amazing insight. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I there, there may be more to it. I'm sure somebody else has done more research on this, but I just thought that's uh, really interesting, kind of coming full circle to like, okay, where's the positive view here? And maybe that's it. But, you know, like about, I think Salome was a more popular name. If I remember from that article, Salome was a little bit more popular than Miriam or Mary, but both of them, I mean, it was like a quarter of the women during that period of time were named Salome and about a quarter were named Mary and then the rest various other names and so it was extremely popular and I guess that's why there's six different Marys in the New Testament um, which is a significant amount when you consider it you hardly get any women's names. That's a good point. So, so that's actually a, a very interesting uh, strategy there 
I, I wonder if, if I had stumbled upon that same thread, if I would have taken it as far as you did. In other words, I, I may have gone down and saw the meaning of, of Mary and, and drilled down into the primitive root. I wonder if I would have gone so far as to say, well, what's the positive view on that? And I, so I, I, I love how you're continuing to question and search and try to come up with an answer. And in some cases you might not come up with an answer, maybe not now, maybe not later. But in this particular case, you did come up with something that, that actually is, is meaningful. And so I do find that, uh, you know, I, I am using um, Strong's Concordance a lot more and going out and using some of those various resources, which is very helpful to understand meanings of words and, 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 and it just enhances your understanding. But I think that the key, and you talk about this a lot, Oak, and a lot of the stuff that you do is just continuing to ask questions, I think is a very powerful concept and, and, and seeing where those questions take you. Yeah, I because th there's so many things in the gospel, like, uh, you know, if we go back to um, Abinadi, you know, it, it, you can read that once and go, well, wait a minute, you know, how does this doctrine work? That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't sound like, uh, you know, the, the regular separate Trinity concept, you know, or, or uh, members of the Godhead concept that we're familiar with. How does, how does that make sense? And if, if we don't dig, like, you know, you, you talked about your digging into that, that uh, we just don't understand. And, um, you know, I was hoping there was some, something here, but you're right. Sometimes, sometimes you go down a tangent or, you know, a rabbit hole and, and you, you can't get satisfaction from finding something that, uh, you know, kind of addresses it. But, you know, in this case, there was something there that uh, made sense. Well, that is the end of the verse. And so I thought uh, just before we close here, um, number one, have you, I just had a few questions. Like, have you ever done this where you took one verse and studied it in depth like this? I've never done this. I, you know, I've, I've done some different things, but this is the first time that I took one verse and went this deep. Have either of you ever done this before? Yeah. Parts of verses, but not, not anything like this. Okay. Brad, you've done this before. What? Yeah. Yes. Um, I did this uh, recently and, and it was interesting because it wasn't just a week. It was like, it seemed like it was months and I was reading and, and studying other things in, in the middle. So it wasn't like I, that was the only thing I was focused on, but you know, I, I, uh, it's the verse, it's the verse, um, that Nephi talks about. We're all familiar with it. Second Nephi 25, 23, where he says, we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. And, uh, and so, you know, early in my, uh, early years of the church, we'll say back when I was youth and, and, and serving in, on a mission, you know, I always kind of subscribe to what's commonly referred to in the church is, you know, I do all that I can do, and then the Lord fills in the rest, right? So that kind of gives you the connotation of, you know, we earn, you know, salvation to some degree. And as I matured in the gospel, you know, I, I very quickly shifted that paradigm to say, no, there's, there's nothing that I can do. In fact, King Benjamin talks about it. You know, there's nothing that we can do. It's, it's entirely the Savior and his grace. And so that's that whole balance of, of works and, um, and mercy that, you know, you're, you're trying to, to, to reason that out. And, uh, and, and where I've concluded in, in, in that study is, is that, you know, I can qualify for the mercy of the Savior and his atonement by repenting. And that's my part, right? And, and there's things that I can do in terms of making covenants and, and, and having ordinances, but it's, it all comes down to repentance and qualifying for the mercy and grace. And, and I'm getting too deep into this, but yes, I've, you know, I'll come across the scripture that will pose a question that will just cause me to go, what does that mean? And right. so I've done that here. There was another one that I've done. In, in the book of Alma, I can't remember the exact reference, but it's the one where it talks about that when, when the spirit dies, we'll be taken home to, to, uh, to God. And, and, and so I was trying to reconcile, you know, that with what we know in terms of the spirit, the spirit world and, and, and prison and, and trying to understand some of that. So yes, I, I, I enjoy doing kind of that deep dive on a particular verse that catches your attention and creates questions. Bob, in, in your study this week, and 
uh, and then Brad, you know, did, was this um, experience, do you feel like this was a, a beneficial uh, kind of activity this week? There's no question about what we've learned from it. The question is, do I have the time to devote to one verse like that when there are a bunch of other things I want to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do uh, understand that because like, you know, just trying to keep up with uh, come follow me lessons and everything. It, it, we kind of like, there's so many things to study. And so it does have to kind of be like, sort of like what Brad was doing is like, I really want to understand this. And so he spent a lot of time on a particular verse over a period of time, an extended period of time. And I uh, just really tried to understand the the concepts there while he was studying other stuff. So yeah, I, I totally get that. Um, so what, what did you think of like this webinar experience? I've never done this before and this was an experiment. So uh, is this the kind of thing that, um, yeah, I, I wanted to have this more interactive with other people. And obviously this is a really small group. We had you know about 15 people signed up for it, but um, was this enjoyable to discuss the scriptures this way? Or is this kind of thing? It's like, well, it was kind of cool. You know, we did this and, but it, you won't hurt my feelings. Uh, you know, if you're like, well, probably not something in the same uh, format in the future. What, just any kind of feedback or thoughts on that? So I'll take a cut at it. So I, I love this idea of um, one of the things that I really enjoy uh, that, that helps me engage more deeply in scripture studies when I know I'm going to be on the spot. So I taught gospel doctrine a few years ago, happened to be Old Testament the last time we did that. Mm -hmm. And I had never really, you know, studied the Old Testament in its entirety. And so I was a little bit uh, nervous at first, but it really helped me to dig in and study because I knew I was going to, you know, be up in front of a group of members and needing to, you know, lead and facilitate a discussion. And so, yeah, having that accountability that, hey, you know, you're going to come back and, and you, you know, like you've done here, you, you, you say, hey, what did you think? And, and if you haven't done any study or research on it, you're like, I got nothing, right? So, uh, I did. I did find some benefit in this. Um, I wish I had taken more time to study this than I actually did. Um, but I, I, I do think this is a great forum, a, a great opportunity that you know. If, if I know, you know, two weeks or a month from now that we're going to have a webinar and, and discuss our thoughts and share, um, I, you know, I, I definitely would spend the time to to go through and and, and do that preparation. Okay. Yeah, I know. And this was short notice too, because I just announced it a week ago. And, uh, you know, here we are just seven days later. And nothing drives me more bonkers than having, uh, like with the, the pandemic right now, having Zoom Sunday school for 30 minutes. And, you know, the teacher is supposed to cover chapters, you know, in 30 minutes. And it's like, you just can't get deep. You just, it's all like surface level kind of stuff. And I would almost prefer that they say, well, you know what, you've all read the chapters, right? <laughs> Which, you know, only a few people ever really actually keep up on the chapters, but because there's so many things to study, but, uh, you know, I would almost just prefer them to say, I found this verse really interesting, this concept, let's talk about it for 30 minutes, you know, kind of like what we just did here for an hour, just like go deep on something that uh, is of interest that um, could be a really deep, meaningful discussion that I, that's maybe just my preference. But uh, anyway, that's not a bad idea. I, I may do that on my next priesthood lesson, take a talk of one of the conference talks coming up and pick out a paragraph and talk about it. Yeah, I not I a bad think, idea at all. I think there's a lot of value to just like, let's really go deep on this concept and see, you know, what we can find out, you know, just this one verse. I, I had no idea at the beginning of the week, uh, you know, where it would take me, uh, you know, I, yeah. I read it and it was pretty straightforward. Right. And I was like, well, I'll just start studying and see what comes up. And um, I, I felt like it was a, a valuable exercise for me. So. Yeah, yeah. I'll share just one more uh, experience related to that. So uh, when we flipped over from Old Testament to New Testament, um, I, I got released shortly thereafter to 
for a different calling, but um, that was right when we started Come Follow Me. And uh, I was brainstorming different ideas for, for how to best, um, you know, get insights and participation from the, the, you know, the audience in there instead of me just standing up there and droning on for 40 minutes or something. But how could we get more interaction and involvement and, and you know, really kind of bring out the, 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 um, the essence of Come Follow Me, which is, you know, home-centered, church-supported. And so I wanted to model that kind of in the classroom. And so one of the things that, uh, that, I, that I did was, I think we had somewhere like six to eight different principles that were in that particular week's uh, lesson. And I just wrote them up on the chalkboard and said, hey, what I wanna do this week is just uh, talk about which of these principles you wanna talk about. And it was an insightful lesson to see how that went. Uh, I, I was prepared to go wherever the class went but we ended up only talking about two of them for the entire time. And it was amazing how much, and, and so in that particular class, I think that in, in, in that example, I did the least amount of talking that I had ever done. And it was, it was literally like an 80-20 shift. Usually it's me 80% of the time and 20% participation from the audience. In that particular class, it was the exact opposite. And it was just such an enriching class. And I had so many people come up to me afterwards and say that that was probably one of the best lessons that they'd ever participated in and the the beauty of that it was it wasn't me it was them right it was their yeah. participation and their engagement in that topic that made it so much more meaningful because it wasn't just the you know the classroom teacher up there droning on but it was the class sharing in their experiences that made it such an enriching class yeah. so so the bottom line here i guess for me is you know, having the opportunity to come together and share each other's insights and experiences is, is rewarding, especially if you know that you're going to come, you know, you, you need to come prepared to, to share something, you know, you're going to spend more time digging in than you might otherwise. Yeah, yeah. So maybe, maybe in a future uh, experience like this, um, you know, obviously plan it further out, uh, but then specifically, uh ask people maybe to like prepare something they they would share online like their own powerpoint or something um and kind of rotate through um to kind of give people that accountability feeling yeah that's a great idea okay all right i'll i'll uh toy with this some more and see um see what uh what we can come up with for another experimental webinar so anyway thanks thanks for being on and i appreciate uh, your participation and um we'll we'll try something like this in the future thanks i'll appreciate it okay yep. enjoyed it thank you okay thanks see you guys see ya. bye